Welcome to this Federalist Society Faculty Book Podcast, discussing Professor Patrick Gary's new book, Limited Government and the Bill of Rights. Thank you for tuning in. Limited Government and the Bill of Rights takes a novel approach to the constitutional connection between the Bill of Rights and the principles of limited government. Gary proposes that the Bill of Rights should be viewed primarily as the limiting power of a government rather than protecting of the autonomy interests of individuals. He argues that this limited government approach is ultimately the best way to maximize individual liberty and limits judicial overreach by denying courts the power to create and enforce expansive autonomy-based rights. Author Patrick Gary, professor of law and director of the Hagman Center for Legal and Public Policy Research at the University of South Dakota School of Law, is joined by critical commenter Lee Strang, professor at the University of Toledo College of Law, to discuss the book. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speakers. And now, Professor Gary. Okay, so I thank the Federalist Society today for uh, hosting this podcast, and we're talking about uh, my book, which was recently published by the University of Missouri Press, Limited Government and the Bill of Rights. Well, in this book, I argue that the purpose and function of the Bill of Rights is to act as a limitation on the power of government. In this respect, the Bill of Rights is consistent with the overall scheme of the original Constitution. Insofar as the Bill of Rights, along with that Constitution, seeks to define and limit the power of this federal government that was created through the constitutional document. Well, this argument presented in the book then differs from the more popular modern understanding of the Bill of Rights as principally focused on ensuring a certain level of individual autonomy rather than on the organization or definition of government power. Also in the book, I recognize the desire of the constitutional framers to protect individual liberties and natural rights. Indeed, natural rights had formed the basis of the American campaign for independence from Britain. I have uh, Lee Strang on the podcast with me, and he's done a lot of work in this area, and and it'll be interesting to talk with him about that. But I play off of uh, much of his work in this area in terms of recognizing that that desire was certainly prevalent during the constitutional framing period. But I draw a distinction between that desire and actually what was included and why within the document itself. So I argue that it's really one thing to value natural rights, but it's quite another to provide for specific constitutional protections of them. Because the constitutional framers did not have a clear idea of how to define natural rights, much less incorporate them into a written constitution for enforcement, they framed the Bill of Rights then as limited government provisions rather than as natural rights provisions. To the framers, then limited government would be the constitutional path to the maintenance of liberty rather than, say, a judiciary, which was charged with enforcing individual natural rights. So I then argue in the book that the Bill of Rights was seen as necessary because the original Constitution did not really sufficiently limit the power of government. Furthermore, courts, as I argue, could more easily and objectively apply the Bill of Rights as limited government provisions than as provisions seeking to protect some vague notions of individual autonomy. And finally, crafting the Bill of Rights as limited government provisions would not give the judiciary the kind of wide-ranging power that would be needed to define and enforce those notions of individual liberty. So with respect to the application of this limited government model, the book focuses specifically then on the First Amendment. It examines how the courts in many respects have already used a limited government model in their First Amendment decision-making. In short, one of the key elements of the limited government model involves an inquiry into whether a particular First Amendment right, for instance, would be needed so as to ensure or sustain limited government. And finally, I think this approach to the First Amendment may allow for a more objective and restrained judicial role than is often applied under contemporary First Amendment jurisprudence, which oftentimes, I think, swings back and forth between some notion of limited government and then at other times some kind of notion of trying to fulfill some kind of like judicially defined sense of individual autonomy. So I hope that gives a fairly overall description of the book, a scheme of the book, and pass it over to Lee then. Sure. Thank you very much, Pat. And uh, for giving me the opportunity to reread your book, and I've been looking forward to our conversation. And of course, thanks to the Federal Society for giving us this platform to discuss your important book. What I'll do first is I'll offer what I think are the key points of your book and then offer uh, some questions and that will hopefully spark dialogue between us. So the key point that I see your book making, which you articulated in your introduction, Pat, 
is that the Bill of Rights is either entirely or also a structural check in the federal uh, government. And that's an important facet, I think, of the Constitution that's been lost, or at the very least it's been underemphasized. I think you do a good job of describing how at least since the New Deal, and what's going to be one of my questions later, at least since the New Deal, the individual rights view has been the dominant view um, by, by people of all different political or interpretive stripes. And this loss has had a lot of negative consequences, many of which you identify, including licensing judicial, I'll put it in quotes, creativity in interpreting those different rights. And your view is that the Bill of Rights structural check complements these other structural checks in the Constitution, such as separation of powers and federalism that you identify. And the revival that your book represents in the structural facet of the Bill of Rights, I think, is part of a broader recovery of that view. And, and the person that came to mind reflecting on your book today was Kurt Lash, who you cite and repeatedly discuss his work. And so I see you and Kurt and other folks doing, making a similar relatively recent move. And I think that's been an important move. Another key move that you make is to point to the New Deal as either the major turning point or at least a major turning point in the Supreme Court's treatment of the Bill of Rights. And I certainly think that's the case. There's a lot of evidence for that. You provide a lot of evidence for that. And anecdotally, in teaching over the years, one of the things that's come to be more firmly entrenched in my own teaching and what I try to convey to students is the pivotal role that the New Deal played. I think that you do a really good job of laying out the dominant perspective of the Bill of Rights, the individual rights perspective, focusing on the work of people who I know we both respect, like Randy Barnett, while also acknowledging that your structural view, I think this is one of the neat moves you make, you're able to take on board much, if not most, of what the individual rights view offers people and then add something in addition to that. And one of the important burdens that you, you face in your book, I think, is that in proposing your structural model for the Bill of Rights, it, you have to show how it cashes out differently, how it's better than the alternative individual autonomy model, and you recognize that in the book, and you propose a number of ways in which your model leads to better results. For example, you argue that your model leads to less conflict with democracy, that it doesn't pit always individuals versus society or individuals versus community. It's, it's that way sometimes, but it's, it can be the two in tandem on many occasions. You also argue that your model is more suited to judges' ability that judges are not good at, you claim uh, in many different places, making the type of judgment calls that judges have to make when articulating, defining, and balancing individual rights. And I think this is in one of the most interesting parts of your book, which I hadn't thought much about before, is that your structural view fits and explains especially the court's free speech law better than other views, especially given the prominence of political speech in the, in the Supreme Court's doctrine, which doesn't really have a doctrinal cubbyhole in the court's free speech, it doesn't mean automatically strict scrutiny or it doesn't mean automatically some other type of doctrinal consequence, but it's always mentioned, if it's relevant, in the Supreme Court's opinions. And your structural view accounts for that in a way that the individual rights view can't account, or at least not as well. And historically, you show that at the time of the framing ratification, Americans understood rights as subject to many and sometimes substantial limits. And this facet of history, I think, often gets lost in the telling of people who want to support in advance the individual rights view. And, but it supports your view that since individual rights are not absolute and therefore subject to regulation, then judges will be making a lot of judgment calls that maybe they're not very good at. And relatedly, your book is the result clearly of tremendous research and reading, which is evidenced by, if you look at the footnotes, lots of footnotes, and to the relevant people and to the relevant scholarship, especially I brought up the example before of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. And one of the most interesting proposals you make is at the, at the end of the book, where you t propose what you call the equal protection view of the Bill of Rights. And as you show, this view fits a lot of different parts of the Supreme Court's case law in a lot of different areas, free speech, establishment clause, free exercise clause. And I'm going to follow up this point in, in, in my questions, which I'm going to turn to right now. One of the questions I have, Pat, is that you argue that the Supreme Court's focus on the Bill of Rights as a source of individual rights severed it from the Constitution's structural orientation, or at least made it hard to make that connection. And I think your description of the history is right on. It fits the Supreme Court's decisions and its reasoning. But one of the things that came to mind was one of the reasons given by the Supreme Court and by its academic supporters at the time for the shift away from structural enforcement is that the argument from relative institutional competence, that these people argued that the Supreme Court is really good at protecting rights, but not good at enforcing structural provisions. And I think you see this line of reasoning culminate in Garcia versus San Antonio, where Justice Blackmun says, full out, 
federalism, structural limitation, not judicially enforceable, just politically enforceable. And so one of the questions that I would have would be, how do you respond to that common argument that judges are not institutionally competent to do structural limitations? And then another question I have is that you argue that the New Deal was either the A or the major turning point in the Supreme Court's treatment of the Bill of Rights, and that that promissory note was made in Caroline Products footnote 4 and then redeemed in the Warren Court. I think you do a real great job describing that history. But I, I guess I did wonder whether or not the break was as clean as you seem to describe it, and whether or not that prior to the New Deal, and here I'm thinking of the, the Lochner era, the classical substantive due process era, those seem to be a lot about individual rights. And so was it as clean a break as you describe it in the book, or was it more mixed, maybe just a, a re-emphasis on the individual rights component, or maybe an exclusion of the structural component that did exist prior to the New Deal? Another question I have was, one, I, one of your most cogent criticisms of the individual rights model is that it leads judges to make deeply contested judgments about the scope, the weight, and the harm that's done to individual rights. And I wonder if that argument is as powerful today after the Supreme Court has been in the business, so to speak, of articulating and defining individual rights throughout most of the 20th century and is putting that in Supreme Court precedent that's been building on itself. And so we have a relatively thick, like I'm thinking of the free speech clause area, we have relatively thick legal doctrine that's thickly embedded in Supreme Court precedent. And so it seems like in, in those situations, even if you're on the individual rights view, that judicial creativity is relatively hedged in. Whereas if we were to adopt your view, which would be new or be a new move, as you acknowledge in your book, it seems like we're opening up relatively more discretion. The, the next question I have is that you argue that your limited government model provides a different and a better analysis for judges when they're faced with claims raised under the Bill of Rights. And making this case, this claim that is essential to your project, but when I looked at how you cashed out the different tests that you articulated and how this new view would work, it also it caused me some concern. So, for example, on page 56, you state that the judicial inquiry under their structural view is different than the individual rights model, and here's how you, you phrase it. Will approving the government restrictions in question eliminate an effective source of control over the government? And then later on page 63, you describe this process as one of balancing. And so this analysis seems to be kind of close to the judgment-laden tests that you are criticizing in the individual rights context. And so what I was wondering, is there a way that you can flesh out and make these tests less subject to criticism than the individual rights test? And then what I'll end on is, I mentioned earlier that your proposal about the equal protection view of the structural rights model of the Bill of Rights. And I, I think it has a lot to commend it. In particular, it fits a lot of the case law in a way that I hadn't really thought about before I read your book. But there were two things that struck me when I was reading your proposal. The first was that, unlike the rest of your book, where you spend a lot of time arguing that your structural model is faithful to the Bill of Rights' original intent or original meaning, which I, and I think you do a good job of that, here, that claim, the, yeah, the equal protection view, I don't see much of that going on. I, I don't see you connecting it back to any earlier historical materials. Now, that may not be, maybe certainly a plausible reason for that, but I didn't see that articulated in the book. And the second related uh, thing that struck me was that this equal protection view, uh, and it follows on my previous point, seems to invite judicial discretion because you state on page 133 that here's how the inquiry would go. Whether the equality principle has been violated, in other words, whether one group of people or one set of ideas has been singled out and treated differently in terms of their exercise of rights provided in the Bill of Rights, which that seems relatively flabby in the same way that some of the individual rights tests uh, or individual rights views might have seemed flabby as well. So I th think there's lots of things going on in your book. I think you make a lot of powerful points and left you with a, with a number of questions and, and suggestions. So back to you, Pat. Hey, that's a great summary of the book. I appreciate it. I'm looking over my notes. Uh, I think I've filled three pages of notes so far. I can hardly <laughs> read my own writing, so I'm going to try to respond to the questions, but raise them again as, as we talk, and we'll, we'll try to maybe have a back-and-forth item. I appreciate the summary, and there's good questions. So let me start off, I think, with the first area that you brought up with this, is the New Deal um, mm -hmm. a constitutional revolution and what was going on there. And, and, I mean, first of all, I think any time you try to identify sort of a clean break occurring at a certain point in time, of course, it's always never that clean. But when I look at the New Deal era in terms of the court doing its, its sort of switch in 1937 and then upholding the New Deal, legislation. And in doing so, it really had to draw back from these structural provisions, like you said, of, of federalism and separation of powers. 
Yeah. What I so, so I, I think that had, as I trace it, two impacts. One is it, it pulled the court away from thinking about structural provisions of the Constitution. It's like, well, okay. this isn't uh, – the court, I think, was defensive, felt under a lot of criticism for striking down early New Deal legislation on those grounds, so it, it didn't want to get involved. It mm-hmm. felt incompetent, and I don't know if it really felt that way, but it certainly conveyed that impression. And then in the Caroline footnote, it sort of indicated that we're going to pull back on structural provisions, but we're going to we're going to be very involved on individual rights matters. I think you can look at that a couple of ways. And one way in which I look at it, in a way, is saying that I think the court did that voluntarily. Yes, and I think it felt much more comfortable on, on an individual rights area than on structural provisions area. But in a way, also, it kind of had to do that because if you look at the history, and you've done work in this area too, Lee you see that the, the structural protections in the Constitution is what the framers really thought, that's how we're going to protect liberty. Sure. But if you quit enforcing that, well, how else can you protect liberty? And it's like the Bill of Rights is all that you have left. Yeah. And that sort of vaults the court then more into a, a sort of a much more aggressive or intervening point in terms of judging individual rights provisions of the Bill of Rights more because of this loss of, of structure. And I do think that it took, you know, as, as we see it, it, it really took the court a long time to revisit just the notion of structure. Yeah. The, the Rehnquist court brought it back in the in the uh, in its, its federalism revolution. There was the hint of it in the 70s, but that went nowhere, like the Garcia case I cited. It, it could sort of loses track of structure within the rest of the Constitution. And I think then that, that, that sort of my implied argument is that it really lost sight of the structural aspect of the uh, of the Bill of Rights. And I, I make the argument, like you were saying, people like uh, Randy Barnett and Kurt Lash pointing out that, and I'm a big believer of this, I think the Bill of Rights is consistent with the Constitution rather than as something radically different. And the Constitution looks at structure. And so I think that's what the uh, Bill of Rights uh, also does. And the main structure is once you're empowering this central government is to be able to put limits and boundaries on it. I think the Bill of Rights does the same thing. Pat, what I take from what you're saying is that it wasn't that the people in the Supreme Court actually thought that they were not adept at enforcing structural principles. It's that, figuratively speaking and politically, they got beat, and so they had to beat a retreat. The only place where they could make a stand of having some type of effective judicial review was in the individual rights area. That's what I think. I mean, I think the way they saw it is that they did have to make a retreat from it. But again, you're talking about a court that was divided. And so you're not talking about a court that went from 901 way to 90 the other way. I mean, you're you're talking about a very thin transition here. But I do think they they felt they got beat. And then so if you're going to back away from structure and, you know, if you look at the types of cases that the Supreme Court decided up until about the mid 20th century, Primarily, they're structural cases on government yeah. power. Yeah, and that was and really interesting. You talk about that in your book, and I had not, I mean, I never had internalized that, that, that we are living, maybe it's because I'm a, a modern American lawyer, where it's all about individual rights, when it wasn't always the case. That structure played a lot of the, took up a lot of the court's docket in the old days. Yeah, I mean, structure and questions of power and the boundaries of power, whereas once we get to the Warren Court era, we become very accustomed to the fact that much of what the court's doing is individual rights and individual freedom, and then we begin thinking about individual autonomy. But that wasn't at all the focus of the court prior to that time. But if the court's primary focus is on power and structural matters, and then they're going to pull back from that after the New Deal, then, you know, what do they settle upon? And it seems like, you know, regardless of what you think they actually thought, the results are that that they pretty clearly settled on individual rights matters because that takes up much more of the docket than it used to. What do you think about the other question I had that's related to this, where the pre-New Deal era, so I'm on board with what you said regarding pre-New Deal enforcing limited and enumerated powers. The Commerce Clause actually has limits to it. But what Mm -hmm. about in in the Bill of Rights side? So in the Lochner era in the Bill of Rights side, what role did structural claims have? What change was there from the Lochner era on the Bill of Rights interpretation over to the post-New Deal inside? That's a very good point you bring up, because if you take a look at the Lochner era, you can categorize that as a kind of individual rights era, I suppose. It was at least a and part of it, right? A big chunk yeah. of it. And clearly then that that was done in then by the New Deal constitutional revolution in terms of we're not going to be 
Lochner is not going to be the part of our format, although, of course, Lochner comes back then with the, say, the privacy decisions then. Yeah. Once we get substantive due process later on, and we're just changing the nature of the substantive due process from an economics right to a kind of privacy or personal right. So Otten Lochner ends up coming back and com- ends up coming back very strongly. But I think that you could also see Lochner as a way in which the court was trying to limit government power and it used the means or method or, or venue of Lochner in order to do it. But that's a point that you could argue over in terms of you could say, well, the court was, I think you could make an interpretation of Lochner as something that was very individual rights oriented. You could easily make that interpretation. I end up making the interpretation that, that the court kind of stumbled. I mean, after all, that, that error has been very highly criticized. And that I think the court was stumbling around, and I'd still make the argument that it was still fairly consistent, that the focus was still really on limited government. One of the things that struck me, because I teach the Commerce Clause doctrine separately from substantive due process, but when you look at the dates on the cases from the relatively narrow interpretation of the Commerce Clause and the dates of the Lochner era cases, and some of the arguments that are used in both contexts are very similar. So reading your book, it maybe reflect again on, was Lochner era really about individual rights, or was it about a mechanism, as you're suggesting, to limit structure? And I need to do some more thinking on that, but that's an interpretation of that era that I hadn't thought as much about until I read your book. I think that's, that's valid. Yeah, and I, I don't address that issue that you bring up real clearly in the book itself. And I do think that's that's one of those things where that would be like one of those issues where I, too, would really think through that because I wouldn't really want to go on record as saying Lochner was so just simply concerned with structural limits on government. That would be a pretty hard argument to make. And that's why it would have to be an argument that, it was a vehicle towards structural concerns, or it was individual rights plus structural concerns, and then after the New Deal, the structure stuff just died or it was dropped, while the individual rights stuff was transformed into the modern thing that we've got now. Yeah, because the court's always going to be concerned about liberty, always. I mean, the court always is, and the court's going to be concerned about government power. And so liberty in general and government power were part of Lochner, and I think the court, again, at that sort of early point in time, really, when you think about constitutional litigation, sort of trying to find its way, and I think Lochner could lead one to a lot of different interpretations. One of the most things that was provocative about your book, Pat, was what you call the equal protection view. I was interested to see more where you where you derive that. And I, I had the, the, the question there about its tie to the historical materials, but when it comes to the case law, I think there's a lot to commend it. But the historical materials, I thought your arguments were thinner on that. And so where did you come up with or derive the, what, is it the last chapter, the equal protection view? Right. So I go through the book and I say that the Bill of Rights can really can be understood as, as limited government provisions and so that they can really be understood as something that is focused just like the rest of the Constitution is focused on how do you limit and control the power of this new central government. And I derive that argument a lot through if you look at, again, like you're right, through historical documents and, and I think in many ways, Lee, you know this area better than I do, but I look at, the, for instance, the Anti-Federalists. Mm-hmm. And a couple of points keep coming up. Really concerned about the power of the central government. Mm-hmm. And how do you control it? I thought the, the Bill of Rights were like a way that they said, here's a way we can do it. It seems different a little bit from the main document. And there is so little debate. The other thing that strikes you is there's very little debate on these Bill of Rights provisions as if they were smart. They thought, how can we put another limit on that people will accept? And, well, let's put it on. Every, everyone agrees with free speech. Everybody agrees with free exercise of religion. So let's use that as sort of an additional type of limitation on government power so that government power cannot extend into those areas. And so then when I get to the equal protection, I said, well, okay, is the Bill of Rights only about limiting government power? Does it not have any concern with actually protecting individual rights? Okay. And that's my point about the equal protection argument, because I say, well, I think the framers had to have, I mean, after all, they put it into it, they had to be concerned about these individual rights. So how were they going to protect it if they weren't going to protect it by way of giving judges power to define, like a natural right of free speech, to define what that right meant and how do you actually go about protecting it? So that's where I derive this equal protection view in terms of how I think the the Bill of Rights actually protects individual rights. I mean, that's very astute of you 
do I have historical materials like I do on the other part of the book? I don't. And I think I, the reason I'd say that is because there wasn't the kind of history on protecting individual rights that there was on protecting structural rights. Okay. There wasn't the debates. The court really didn't begin deciding, say, First Amendment cases, not really until the 20th century. So you, you don't have that kind of historical guidance at all. But you also don't have any kind of historical guidance if you're just going to take like a, a natural rights or individual autonomy view either, because you just haven't got it. I think you do a good job, like with looking at Philip Hamburger's work, pointing out to the a lack of consensus as to the content of these rights, which would argue against them being strongly judicially enforceable in the way that, that, for example, Randy Barnett has argued very forcefully that judges are supposed to be judicially enforcing natural rights. He does, and in many ways I agree with Randy Barnett. I think he'd agree with me on the structural aspect, but he would argue for a natural rights interpretation of the Bill of Rights. And uh, again, another couple of arguments I use is that I just don't think when you look at work of individuals like Philip Hamburger, you just don't see the kind of agreement. Now, you make a great argument that I use um, in your work, and you say that um, you, you can't take the Declaration of Independence, which is seen as a natural rights document, and incorporate it into the Constitution, thereby sort of making the Bill of Rights all about natural rights. Yeah. And I think your argument's very persuasive, because you say, look, that was all about breaking with England. It wasn't about creating a document of governance. And I, I, I think that's the historical evidence is very strong there. That It's like we, we believe in natural rights in a very general way, and we can use it to break with what we see as an oppressive rule from England. But once we actually decide how to govern ourselves, what do we really mean by natural rights? If we want to positively define it, I don't think that existed. Yeah, and I was surprised because I grew up, I'm an American, I love individual rights, and I love the Declaration of Independence, and so my initial presumption in going into the research was that I was going to find support for the proposition that declaration is an additional support or maybe the vehicle through which natural rights are meant to be protected by the federal judiciary, among other ways, and I, and I didn't see it there, as you described. One thing, you know, Pat, I'm very sympathetic to, for lots of reasons, many of, many of the moves that you make in your book, and the one thing that I kept on thinking in reading that, it's, it's a similar thing when I'm doing my own scholarship, is what's the likelihood of the return to the structural view? What are your thoughts on that? Because that's one thing that, with my own scholarship, a lot of it, I, you know, writing about originalism, when, when's that going to take off? <laughs> yeah, right. You've done a lot of work on originalism. You kind of think we've drifted a long way away from that. I, for instance, personally hold the viewpoint that the Establishment Clause should never have been incorporated through the 14th Amendment, but sure. you know, I don't really include that within my view of the Establishment Clause, because I just don't think that's ever going to happen, that it's yeah. going to be reversed. It's one thing, I mean, we're academics, so we can theorize and look at history and look at theoretical structure, but what kind of impact is it going to have? That's pretty difficult to view. But I do think that the court, in looking at the Rehnquist era, the court did begin bringing back structure and to some degree, even in the recent health care decision, it brought back structural concerns that upheld the law, but it did sort of continue, in a sense, mm -hmm. reviving structural limitations like the, the Commerce Clause. Yeah. So well, how can it do, do so with the Bill of Rights? I mean, I don't know, but I think the conscientiousness has been raised. Yeah, and I think even the, the recent D.C. Circuit opinion regarding the Appointments Clause and what counts as a recess, that those kind of arguments that are originalist-based arguments and the structural arguments have resonance, not just with the Supreme Court, but even the lower courts as well. Yeah, if you look at what's happened in the Establishment Clause, you know, the Establishment Clause was defined in its early decision, let's say in the, in the 1970s largely, and then getting into the 80s. And if you read the early decisions there, which I think distorted the Establishment Clause away from where it was intended, mm -hmm. you don't see much reference to history. And then as the Establishment Clause sort of, again, sort of started pulling back from where the court took it, in the, say, in the 70s, it comes back and plays an important role. And I think that's an example of, and of course, the court's now divided on that. But history in general has, has really come back, and it's been people like you and others who have worked a lot in originalism, has really sort of stressed the importance of this. And uh, I think one of the biggest changes is that now you're seeing people on the other side of the argument also relying on originalism. They're coming mm -hmm. to different conclusions, but they're relying on it. Yeah, I, I think that's it, it can be both either a positive or negative phenomenon. 
But it's certainly a compliment, right, that these arguments have enough power that I'm going to utilize them as well. And, uh, and, and you, yeah, you see that both in Supreme Court opinions, lower court opinions, scholarship, and, and of course, the Establishment Clause area that you mentioned. That's a good example. Yeah, they've had a big power. I mean, I think you take a look in the Establishment Clause era and the era of, you know, lemon and the wall of separation and kind of the hostility to religion that was fostered by that, and then Mm -hmm. how it changed. And I think one of the big forces there has been history. You take a look at the Federalism Revolution during the Rehnquist era. That's history. You mentioned the Appointments Clause decision recently. Again, that's been a big power that's been exerted by history. And it's scholarship like yours and others that allows judges to have the credibility to make those arguments in a way that maybe previously before the scholarship, they couldn't have credibly made those arguments. Yeah, it really gives them a a strong intellectual foundation to be able to rely on, to give direction to. Well, we've been talking for um, for a while. I could go on talking for the rest (laughs) of the day with you. This has been great to discuss this and to be able to share this uh, points in the book on uh, I really appreciate it. Appreciate the work you do and the different kind of comments and questions that you're giving me. Yeah, it was a great book. I've I've learned a lot and this I'm sure is not even close to being the last one, is it Pat? I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) We both hope not. Okay, thank you Lee. Great uh, Great to spend this conversation with you. Thank you for listening to this Faculty Book Podcast. For more podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at www.federalistsociety.org forward slash multimedia.